Well, welcome once again to Calaveras Living. On today's program, we're going to talk about the strange history of Utica Mine. And that's, of course, in uh, Angel's Camp. Most of you know that. It's had an ill-starred existence, although highly productive, one of the great uh, gold mines in California. We're going to talk with Rich London, who's uh, visited with us before. We, he's always glad to see him. And he has great experience in the mining business and things about precious metals and various other things. But, Rich, it's good to see you. Well, thank you very much, John. Now, how did you get interested in the Utica mine? Well, we're doing a project through Wangina Research Institute. That's our research and development group mm -hmm. uh, to try and find solutions uh, to mine waste and mine drainage. Okay. Uh, these mines have a lot of water in them. Yeah, a lot of mines around the country do, huh? That's right. And what we're trying to do is... Uh, we have a project over in Tuolumne County in the Competence Mine in which we're using solar energy to pump the water out of the mine and then in the, at night drop the water back into the mine and clear, clean up the water as it goes, removing the toxic waste from it, toxic uh -huh. metals. And at the same time, when the water goes back into the mine, generate electricity with old-fashioned technology called the Pelton Wheel. Uh -huh. And so we have daylight sun, nighttime mine power. Eventual goal, though, that the mining will be done there again? Well, no. Really, the, the underground mines in uh, the, the mother load uh, had been, da been down since 1942, essentially, mm -hmm. when the government shut down all gold mining in California because it was non-essential to the war effort. All the mines flooded, and then when they flooded, the metal uh, equipment that was still in the mines, that just stayed there and rusted. And mm -hmm. then the surface materials from the mine, the surface equipment, in 43 and 44, they had scrap drives, and those went to this war effort. So the miners came back, and they found no equipment left. Uh -huh. And so they were pretty much out of business. Yeah. But anyway, right now, the uh, you have to have a tremendous mine uh, value of ore. Uh, at least $500 a ton in order for a mine to reopen. Oh. That, and plus, you have to go through all the regulatory hoops that Sutter Gold Mine has gone through mm -hmm. in order for it to reopen. And that's taken them, oh, I think it was 11 years to reopen that. And uh, so we're looking to environmentally clean the water out of the mines, use it for power, and then uh, return the water back, and then at the same time recover the metals that are in the water because now we've got great recovery technologies to recover the gold, the silver, lead, zinc, and copper specifically yeah. right out of the water very easily as long as you've got solar power. Oh, that's good. Well, uh, getting to the Utica mine, uh, what was it like in the heyday when it was really productive and things were going well? Busy. The Utica mine was the lifeblood of Angel's Camp. And um, under the uh, leadership of um, uh, the, uh, Charlie Lane and his two partners, uh, that was from the 1880s all the way up to the 1940s, um, they made a lot of money. And a lot of people were mined, uh, were not mined. <laughs> That's bad. That's a slip of the tongue. That's uh, right. In their pocketbooks, maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people were, um, were supported by the mining industry. But the mine was very dangerous. And we had in, uh, I think in 1895, we had a, a disastrous explosions and underground fires in the mine, mm -hmm. and it cost a lot of lives, and there were other accidents over the years, and they're not well documented. And, uh, but the mine was always very difficult. If you don't mind, I'll go into the history of the mine a little bit. Sure. And uh, what I'd like is the... Uh, uh, the first uh, slide, please. Okay, we're going to look at some uh, pictures that you yes. researched, right? And right. Brought, so we'll look at that first one uh, about how things were going there, and you can describe what's happening. It'll come up on the monitor there very shortly. There you go. There There's the mine, uh, the first head frame. Uh, the mine's miner, miners coming out of work, and uh, that was under the, the lane and... Uh, I have to go back to my notes. Uh, the Lane and Hayward and um, mm, what's the other one? Um, oh, that was the mysterious, uh, mysterious period. Well, anyway, they had the money uh, uh, to operate the mine in the next one, please. Mm -hmm. And this is the full mine mill uh, complex. 
Ooh. And it was a very modern mine. Pretty and, extensive. Oh, yes. And they had a chlorination um, system there at the mine for retreating the ores. And I'll talk a little bit later about the ores themselves. Mm -hmm. And then the next one, please. Okay, we'll take a peek at that. This is the shaft again, but underneath it is uh, the, a view of the, uh, um, of the hoist room. Now, that was a very modern hoist room for the day, and so no expense was spared getting the ore in and out. Um, but it wasn't that big of a deal to, uh, um, uh, to bring the miners in and out. They had pretty terrible conditions. Wow. But and when you say hoist, that's both the hoist the ore and the workers? And the workers out, correct. Okay. Now we'll talk a little bit for about the uh, uh, history of the mine. Okay. The uh, uh, history of the Utica mine, it was uh, found it, um, by uh, John Selkirk in 1854. And he was a discouraged miner. And he came out from the placer mines with not much. Okay. And he was ready to go home. That would discourage you. That was discouraged. And... Uh, he was just about ready to try and get a, a stake to get on a boat to go back home to Massachusetts. And what happened was, and this is amazing, is that he, he camped, and it was middle of July, and there was a blue jay uh, causing some irritation to him. And he picked up a rock to throw at the blue jay, and it was full of gold. No oh, kidding. Is, wow. And so he immediately realized that he had something there. And he staked the claim and then started working it. And then he would take the high-grade gold ore and he would put it in what they call an arostra. That's a circular um, uh, grinding platform. Mm -hmm. And you usually have the mule go around and around. It's got a big heavy stone in it. It grinds it up. There's several of them around. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but anyway, um, it only worked for what they call free milling gold ore. That's gold in quartz that the gold comes right out and you can see the gold. And, but the ore over here at the Utica was polymetallic. There would be a little bit of free milling gold ore, but there'd be lead, zinc, copper, and arsenic sulfides. Mm. And you couldn't do anything with those. That was just blasted black stuff. Mm. And so anyway, what uh, uh, John did, he worked and worked and worked, and he couldn't get anything going. He made just enough to uh, just eat beans, etc., uh -huh. and feed his mule. And uh, then he went to uh, Benicia in Sacramento with chunks of gold ore and said, I've got gold ore. And they said, if you don't have ore that runs over an ounce per ton and you don't have 100,000 tons in sight, we don't want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Because during those days, in the 1850s, there were plenty of mines out there, Carson Hill being one, uh -huh. that had that sort of grade and tenor. Sure. So he went back and was very discouraged. And... Uh, some guys came along, they were prospectors, and he said, what do you got in your shaft? And he said, it's the best thing going in the whole mother load. Yeah. And he said, well, would you consider selling it? Well, I might for $200. Well, we got 50 bucks. I'll take the 50 bucks. <laughs> and they said, but you got to throw in the mule. He took the 50 <laughs> bucks, hopped on the mule, head out of town and out of history. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, that's a good so well, anyway, they worked on it. They, they were smarter than he was, and they raised some capital and put in a 20-stamp mill. And the 20-stamp mill was able to process the, uh, the selected high-grade free-milling gold ore. And the free-milling, as I said, means the gold comes out. You can see it. Yeah. And, but they couldn't handle the, the rest of the material. But they knew there was gold in the other sulfides, in the pyrite, in the chalcopyrite, the arsenopyrite, the uh, sphalerite, and the galena. Those were the sulfide ores. Mm -hmm. And that was typical of the ores through here in the mother load. But they couldn't do anything with them. They couldn't get the gold out of them. So anyway, they worked and worked and worked and worked. And then finally, they gave up, and they went away too. And uh, about 1860, uh, about six years later, um, I, uh, Jim Fair. Jim Fair came over with a, a bag of dirty gold. And it was dirty gold because uh, he had gotten the plaster and it had a lot of magnetite in it. It wasn't worth the $12 an ounce. Mm -hmm. But he said, I got a bag of dirty gold. And uh, they said, oh, you don't want to look at this old mine. That's old. Uh, Selkirk's old hole in the ground. He all went broke on it. And he looked at it and he looked at it. And he, said, and he was knowledgeable about some new technologies that come out of Germany. Uh -huh. 
and the new technologies in the or enabled them to smelt the uh, ore, actually, to crush and obtain the, the uh, gold and silver out of the pyrite and the calcopyrite and the rest of the sulfide ores that they never could before mm -hmm. through chlorination. Uh -huh. So he invested some, get some people involved, invested, and Jim was a very, very good mining engineer. And he explored the workings and found first the areas that he could mine and get free gold out of. Then explored the workings and found the areas that he could find these higher grade gold areas, but also with lead, zinc, and copper. Hmm. And so he worked that and he made a lot of money. And he initially put in about $20,000 and he ended up with about a million and a half. A lot of money in those days. That's right. Yeah. And then he got itchy feet. <laughs> because he had heard about the fabulous Comstock. And he decided, wow, let's go over to the fabulous Comstock. So anyway, he went over to the Comstock and uh, he invested with uh, the, uh, on the Hale and Norcross mine over there, which was a fantastically rich silver and gold mine. Mm -hmm. And he made millions. And he sort of lost interest in the old Utica that gave him his stake. Mm -hmm. It was then called Utica Mine. It was called the Utica Mine. He named it the Utica Mine. Yeah. Well, anyway, when he went over to the Comstock, um, you know, he just let the Utica Mine sort of go pot. And they didn't put money back into it. And the Utica Mine always had to have a lot of timber. They said he, they denuded the forest around here, supplying the timber. Because mm -hmm. the ground was very bad. It was like this. It was a shaly schist material, and it brisked. Oh, it breaks right off. Huh. And so if you were underground and you were mining and they put a shot next to you, and all of a sudden the roof came in, you were dead. Sure. And so what they had to do, and it was, this was a genius of Jim Fair. He knew about a thing called square setting. He put like a box type thing of tinker, like tinker toys in there, mm -hmm. and they'd hold the back in. But you had to keep maintaining those because the acid in the water of the mine would eat at the wood. Oh, wow. So you had to use redwood. But yeah. anyway, right. um, then uh, the question is, why is it so ill-starred? Well, because of the, 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 the bad ground it was in and the, because of the difficult working conditions, and they had 125 miles of workings underneath Angel's Camp. Mm -hmm. And they're also full of water. But the real reason it was ill starred was this. After Jim gave up on the mine, it lay abandoned and all the equipment was taken off and it flooded back again. Well, Charlie Lane was a good mining engineer and he recognized the, pa the, the ability to work these sulfide ores and get the gold out of me. And at the, at the same time, recover the lead, the zinc, the silver at the same time, which were also quite valuable at that sure. time. Silver was about, uh, oh, it was a silver dollar. It was a dollar an ounce. And uh, lead and zinc were about eight, nine cents a pound. And there wasn't a lot there, but there was enough to pay for the expenses of timbering at least. Yeah. So we started opening the mine. And he got it opened all the way down. And I'll show the next series of slides okay. um, after uh, I finish here just a bit. Um, we'll go into that. But anyway, um, when he was working the, the mine, um, he, uh, was, he didn't believe in mining engineers or geologists, but he believed in mystics. Mm. And he had a medium in San Francisco that he would take a rock to, and he'd, ha and he'd have her hold the rock, and she'd tell him whether, it was, whether he was going to have gold or not. Not based on the assay, yeah. but uh, not. But anyway, I brought some rocks. Now this, John, as you said before, is light. Well, the mystic yeah. would probably say this, oh, no, there's no gold in this. And the mystic would pick this rock up. and what's Yeah, which is, weighs a ton. Weighs a ton. Yeah. It's about, and she said, oh, I think you'll find gold in this one. Just go over a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, and you'll find gold. Well... He believed it. Well, he came back to 
uh, Angel's Camp told his wife he'd gone see the mystic. Mystic has said, hey, look, go, this is what you do. Mm -hmm. And she said, what did you pay the mystic? Well, we've got a deal. If I find gold, I pay her $1,000 in gold. If we don't find her, I don't, pay, I don't find gold, I don't pay her a thing. Mm -hmm. Well, she said, Charlie, you're crazy. You should not be involved with this mine. Well, anyway, he worked at it and worked at it. And then about three months later, uh, two gentlemen showed up looking for a gold mine. One of them was Elsvina uh, Hayward, and he was a very knowledgeable, a very prim and proper um, uh, mining engineer. Mm -hmm. And he was very knowledgeable about the new techniques of getting all the metals out, including the gold, out of these sulfides. And the other one was a, a guy named Hobart. Well, Hobart was the money man. Well, Charlie said, you know, I took this to the mystic, and the mystic said this. And he said, oh, I believe in that too. So he went into San Francisco to his own mystic with mm -hmm. the uh, same sort of rock and, and the same mystic. And he came back, and he came back with Hobart, the money to do it. They formed a corporation, they, uh, and they mined the, uh, the mine. For, uh, all the way up uh, to it was shut down in 1942. Mm. Now I'm going to show you some pictures of the mine. Yeah. Here we'll we go. It. So this is kind of these are this the conditions underground, and uh, the miners were working a vein above their head, and that vein was just like this rock. It was rotten. It had gold in it, and but the thing about it, it any time you blasted and you didn't have timbering above you, the whole thing could come down on top It'd of collapse. you. Collapse. Hmm. Can we have the next one, please? Damn, this is and that's how they all went down in the mine. They, they, they called it the King of Sardine Club. Well, and how they, many were employed there? There were about 60. 60, okay. With 125 miles of workings, there were about 19 uh, working heads at any one time. Mm -hmm. Next, please. Okay. Next, please. And this is a... This is the, quote, cleanest place in the mine. And that black is not just, you know, blackness from the photograph. That's dirt. Mm -hmm. And so and that's the reason that's so clean, or they tried to keep it so clean, that's where all the electrical equipment was. Mm -hmm. And if all the electrical equipment failed, the mine shut down. Mm -hmm. And so that gives you an idea of the hazards. OSHA would go uh, take a look at that in a minute, and the, or MSHA, and they would shut this mine down in a minute. <laughs> That's why you can't open mines now. Yeah. Next, please. Okay. And that's the mill, and they had kids working in the mill. These are stamp mills, and they had 60 stamps working, and the thunder be could be heard 40 miles away. Oh, wow. And uh, next, please. Yeah, I think that's all on this series. No, there's this one. Oh, here you go. Oh, this, so eventually this is the mansion. Huh? This is the Lane Mansion, and that's open to the public, and people can go see it, and they can appreciate the, the wealth of the mining kings here in Angel's Camp, like, just like they could appreciate the wealth of the mining kings over in, in Virginia City. And where is that located now? That's on uh, right downtown. It's on Utica Street. Oh, okay. And it's, I think it's open uh, two, two or three days a week and on holidays. Okay, but it's like a museum? It's like a museum. Uh-huh. And it was held, owned by the Utica Mine until 1962, I believe. Who's, who owns it now? Oh, I think it's with the, we had a trust, but I'm not oh, sure. okay. Yeah. But it's on the National Register of Historic Places. Wow. And it's completely furnished as if, uh, uh, as if Charlie Lane was in there. That's amazing. So uh, it sounds like the Utica mine had a lot of ups and downs and a lot of people involved and unfortunately some deaths. Oh, they uh, had a lot of deaths. But the thing about it was, and this is sort of controversial, we know of 20 people that died that are memorialized as in a, a marker in the, uh, uh, in the Utica Park. And the reason the Utica Park is down there in the Depression mm -hmm. is because all the underground workings there collapsed. Uh, and uh, so, you know, they're still all down there. Not all the people are down there. They recovered all the bodies. Any old tunnels are water filled. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. And uh, that's our project is uh, for Wanjina Research Institute is to find these 
water-filled tunnels for these uh, polymetallic metal mines, and then take the water out of them, clean the water, and put the water back, you all using solar power to generate the power to do it. Mm -hmm. and so, so that's kind of the few, I mean, you're looking at a number of different mines to, to use that process. Right. right, over here in Calaveras County, and where our pilot project is over at the Confidence Mine, okay. over there in uh, where I live in Confidence, in Tuolumne County. Mm -hmm. The uh, is there any safety factors involved in in these water-filled tunnels and everything under, you know, like in Angels Camp or anywhere else? Is yes, there, any there are. There's a, we did a study of the mine workings underneath the Red Church over uh, in Sonora. Oh, about eight years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, the mine workings themselves were supported by. St they started out being six by six, uh, either cedar or redwood timbers. Mm -hmm. Now the timbers have grown, they've swollen. And oh. they're probably a foot, foot and a half by each direction. And pretty soon they'll collapse. And then like over there at the Red Church, and now it's uh, the, um, I guess it's the Episcopal Church now, mm -hmm. not the Anglican Church anymore. Uh -huh. uh, they, um, they, they may lose their whole... Um, Parish Hall go right down into the mine workings. And underneath Sonora itself, and that's where we know about because we did surveys over there, mm -hmm. there are 30 some miles of mine workings that are near the surface that could collapse. One's right underneath the 49. We recommended in the past that in Angels Camp, uh, Sutter Creek, um, and uh, over in Sonora and uh, Mariposa, that heavy truck, heavy logging trucks not go on certain uh, streets because they could drop through. Well, just the vibrations, I mean, can cause, I mean, just the, yeah. I mean, the weight of them can cause problems, right? And they have fallen through. Uh, Back in 1984, right in front of downtown Sonora, uh, a lumber truck fell right through into the mine workings on the main street. Well, so that's what's going to happen. And it will happen because the mine timbers, because of the acid water, will break down. And then there's, there's, I mean, there's virtually nothing you can do about that then, right? There's a, the only thing that could be done, we recommended this on our project for the, uh, 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 the, the Red Church, was to actually um, fill the workings themselves with concrete, pump the workings with concrete. That would be an enormous amount of concrete, wouldn't it? Well, if you... If you blocked off certain areas and just said, well, let's fill this area and this okay. area, it might not be so onerous. But yes. But in, throughout um, Calaveras and Tuolumne and Mariposa County, there's over 600 miles of underground mine workings. Wow. And the, the, the nice thing about it is this. If we can find out a way to recover the metals from the mine, it would pay for remediation of, the, uh, of these mines and making them safe. Because, frankly, with the regulations here in California, no one can afford to go back into those mines and work them. No, I wouldn't think, or, or just, just the cleanup or, or putting the concrete in. I mean, who would foot the bill for all that unless there was some, that's right. some and that's, resource? And if the water uh, contains the metals and the, if we can track down the owners, and that's part of our project, track down the owners, of who owns the mineral rights to these various mines and say, all right, say it's Soulsbyville. Yeah. Um, you own the mineral rights here. And then a, and the sludge that comes out of the water is yours. And you can send it to the smelter and get paid. Mm -hmm. And then there's the money uh, the clean up, the, uh, cap it up, do whatever you want. Is it hard to track down owners? I mean, yes. Ownership kind of hard. unclear? Well, it's not so much it's unclear, but companies come and go and we're bankrupt. Oh, okay. And when they went bankrupt, the uh, uh, the companies, you don't never know who is the successor to it, and sometimes there is isn't e there isn't a successor, only worthless stock certificates. That's, how uh, how did you get interested in doing? I mean, do you do this kind of on your own or in well, association what it did, with? No, I got interested in, in this because over in Arizona we were working on a project. There was a mining district that we were considering uh, leasing. Mm -hmm. uh, a whole mining district, uh, forty some mines in it, and uh, one of the mine, one of the big problems with that district was it was a uh, very rich silver district, but it didn't have any water, 
and it didn't have any power. And they had to generate power, and it was very expensive to generate power. It was out in the middle of the desert north of Yuma. Mm -hmm. So we came up with the idea, our, our uh, mining and geologic engineer, Bill Hurt, uh, who was on our staff and my second in command, uh, came up with the idea, Rich, let's pump the water out of the mine using solar to generate the power. Then uh, we put up a one to three megawatt solar system, just like they have over here at uh, Modesto, mm -hmm. and then transmit the, the, uh, the power, the excess power we didn't need, over to the uh, uh, Yuma Proving Grounds by microwave, and that's the future. Oh. You don't have to have towers. All you have to have is nobody in between. <laughs> and uh, how did he come up with that idea? I mean, what was it? <laughs> um, he came up with the idea. He was, he's a geologic engineer and uh, metallurgist at U.S. Bureau of Mines. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were working on these innovations before the government, in its infinite wisdom, closed the U.S. Bureau of Mines down. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, I've known Bill for 40 years. I financed his master's thesis at the University of Arizona. Wow. Oh, that's so. You think of these things, they're so innovative that the general public just doesn't understand them. Well, you know, it's right over here at Electra, at Electra, right on the McCallumay River, they pump the water up, put it in the basin when, the, when, there's, when there are low electric uh, uh, usage and low, low cost, and then they let the water come back down again, mm -hmm. and it generates power. Yeah. And there are 14 mines around the world in remote areas that use this hydro solar system and we want it to be used here well that's good well i wish you well just in closing any quick comments about just uh, the utica mine you say it's very worthwhile to go visit the mansion right right it's very, very worthwhile to visit the mansion and um, uh the the kids like to play on some of the equipment over there at the old lightner mine which is just uh, just above the park mm -hmm. um there are shafts there that they're still, they're covered over, but they could fall 600 feet. Yeah, I had heard that some people drop rocks and you don't never hear them hit. That's right. So uh, you have to be very careful. Right, and, and, and if, uh, if you're going on to a mining property, uh, always make sure that the person that owns the property knows that you're there. Otherwise, you're trespassing. Yeah. And the thing about it is, um, don't never go into a mining tunnel, um, never. No. I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't, we shouldn't. But, Rich, it's good to see you always. Everything you talk about is interesting. You well, thank a, you so much for your time, John. We've got to get you back to do some more alchemy things. Too. Okay, we okay. will. Okay. But anyway, I uh, hope you enjoyed that uh, learning about the Utica mine and maybe get by and visit the mansion. And we hope we see you next time on Calaveras Living. Bye-bye.